from Columbia University. Soon to be Dr. Clara Orvis. She's finishing up her PhD in the Applied Math and Physics Department uh, with Lorenzo Pavani. Yeah, some of you guys know him. Uh, Clara graduated from Brown in 07, and then she started her PhD uh, at uh, Columbia. And both Marv and I actually saw her talk at AGU. I can say that both of us were pretty impressed with, with uh, the subject matter and the presentation, so that's why I um, was able to invite Clara here. And she just recently accepted a NASA postdoc at Goddard, so she'll be starting that uh, in May or June or August or something, uh, immediately following graduation. Uh, let's see, what else should we know about Clara? So actually, I thought it was fairly interesting that both of Clara's parents are professors of Spanish or Spanish literature or Spanish culture. So they're probably like scratching their heads, yeah. shaking their heads, like I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Applied math, and we're all like, okay. So there you go, genealogy is in everything. Today, Clara is gonna talk about stratotrope exchange and the title of her talk is Robust Diagnostics, so stratotrope exchange in geoscam. So, uh, you got the laser? I think I do, let me just test it. Oh. Nope, not that. You don't need that. I don't need that. She doesn't need this? No, 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 no. Just the laser. Can you see that? Yeah, so well, we can turn the lights down. Yeah. You failed it then. Let me get Experimental. Is that this little thing? No, I think it needs some battery. Yeah, you have to the batteries on that one. So I, I put the microphone on. If you need me to speak louder, just let me know. So, uh, so first off, I want to thank you very much for having me here. Um, as John said, my name is Claire Orby I'm from Columbia, and most of this work that I'll be discussing today was done with. Lorenzo Polvani from the Applied Math Department at Columbia and with Mark Holzer. Uh, Mark Holzer is, I first met him when he was at NASA GIS, and then he was a research uh, professor at Columbia University, and now he's in Australia. <coughs> so I'm not quite sure how broad this audience is, so I've provided some kind of a basic introduction to the stratosphere and the troposphere and some of the aspects of the atmosphere that I study. Um, so, largely speaking, the atmosphere so, um, so largely speaking, there's an area in the atmosphere called the stratosphere and an area called the troposphere. Um, and I think an, an easy way to think about this is that uh, if you just look at a temperature profile at a given latitude, so for example, this is temperature as a function of height, so pressure is decreasing as we go up. Um, the data that's used here is just taken from an idealized model, and the details of that don't really matter. Uh, I'll explain that later. But what you have to know here is that the structure here and the temperature is what is generally observed qualitatively. And so we see that beginning at the surface, temperature tends to decrease, as we'd expect. We go on top of a mountain, it gets colder there. And then as we increase up into the stratosphere, temperature begins to increase again. And so this is a region where that's unstable to vertical perturbation. So if we had a parcel that was displaced vertically, it would find itself surrounded by air that is colder than it continues to rise. In the stratosphere, the case is opposite, such that it finds itself colder than its ambient uh, density, it bobs down, it continues until, um, until it reaches an equilibrium state. And so an easier way to visualize this is by looking at the isentropic structure of the atmosphere. So here I've just plotted isentropes. Isentropes are lines of constant potential temperature. Again, if you're not in the atmospheric community, these potential temperatures are the temperature that an air parcel would have if it was grabbed at a surface and raised down. If it was grabbed in the, in the atmosphere and if it was brought down to the surface in the absence of any heat or work being applied to it. So in practice, that represents a surface along which parcels preferably move given the absence of external forcing. So it's useful to to plot the isentropic structure in the atmosphere because we can see that it seems like there are roughly two areas, one where the isentropes are given are oriented like this, roughly vertically, and then an area where these isentropes are very flat. 
So this has implications for the time scales, basically how fast air parcels move in the troposphere and the stratosphere. The troposphere time scales are order of weeks to months, and the stratosphere, because this is so stable to vertical perturbations, we have very long time scales. And so I'm interested in the time scales associated with the movement through the stratosphere, and in particular the region that separates the two, the tropopause, which I've shown schematically here in a very time and, and zonally average sense by the big black line. So if you have any questions, of course, please feel free to, to ask along the way. So just as another background slide, this is a <coughs> schematic of the stratospheric circulation <coughs> from one of Alan Clark's papers in 2002. Uh, this is, again, latitude, north pole, south pole, and a rough description of the um, mesosphere, the stratosphere, and the troposphere. And so that black line that was the tropopause is now represented by this dashed line right here. And so we can see in the stratosphere that the black lines represent roughly uh, streamlines along which parcels move. So we have rough upwelling here in the tropics, which extends into a poleward, poleward flow at high latitudes. And again, these are just rough approximations of the streamlines and the direction of the flow in the stratosphere. And these gray lines represent areas where wave <coughs> momentum is deposited. As for synoptic, P for planetary and G for gravity waves. And so here, this, the circulation of the stratosphere is known as, as, a, as a wave driven circulation, the source of those waves being planetary waves that propagated up from the troposphere. So this just kind of gives us a, a rough idea of the, the transport, and this is a transport that has been inferred from observations, and is the transport that one would need to explain the distributions of ozone and water vapor in the stratosphere. So I'm just going to add a few things because I look at this not only from the dynamical perspective, but I'm interested in the actual movement of trace species and stuff in between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So I've just added um, a representation here of ozone. So ozone is produced here near the tropical tropopause and it's transported forward. Um, and it's produced here because there's the rough, roughly the approximate amount of ozone molecules and light. So that this is, quote, the sweet spot for ozone to be manufactured. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that if any of this ozone gets down to the surface, that has implications for surface air quality, UV exposure. And so from, from the transport perspective, the way that the stratosphere and the troposphere communicate is very interesting. So the motivation for this work is that stratotropic strange affects the chemical and the radiant properties of the stratosphere and the troposphere. Um, there have been studies of how the circulation is going to change in the future, and they suggest that there will be an increase in the flux of ozone from the stratosphere into the troposphere. And that has effects on air quality and, and surface UV exposure. And so SDE has been the subject of a lot of numerous studies. Um, there, you have a choice in how you want to quantify SDE. You can use net fluxes, or you can, want, you, or you can use one-way air mass fluxes. And so the net flux is simply the net amount of air crossing a given surface, in this case, the tropopause. Um, but the net flux is not as interesting because it's shown that this net flux is actually composed of two one-way fluxes that are very large. So even if the net flux is zero, you can have non-zero tracer transport, especially in the presence of a, of a background tracer gradient. So from that end, we're more interested in the one-way air mass flux. And that one-way air mass flux too has been estimated using some Lagrangian studies and also some Eulerian studies, particularly using the way method. However, the zero net flux is a difficult thing to estimate. And so the title of this talk and the focus of this will be on developing robust diagnostics of this one-way SDE. So what I mean by when I say that it's difficult to estimate, I think that this figure here from Burnley and Borke show, I think, that, I think that this best illustrates it. And what this does is they're plotting the downward mass flux in the northern hemisphere. So it's a function of latitude. And they've used the Lagrangian method to calculate this one-way flux. So they've taken, they've, they've positioned themselves in the stratosphere and they've run Lagrangian trajectories. <coughs> they've initialized Lagrangian trajectories at different isotropic surfaces in the stratosphere and they've let them move. They've just released these particles. And then as the particles cross the tropopause, they simply count the number, they, they simply count the number that, that cross it and they use that as the measure of the one-way flux. Now they're, they're aware enough to know that this is going to be strongly um, dependent on how long they allow air to stay in the troposphere before crossing the stratosphere. And that's what 
is represented here by tau. So tau is this residence time that air is conditioned to stay in one region before crossing back. And so they've calculated this flux for three different values of this residence time. One is the one-way flux for air conditioned to spend 96 hours. Another is the flux condition on air spending two days and then one day. And so one can imagine that, that if they had calculated this for air having recited one hour or five seconds, then we would have a very large flux. And this has been analytic, analytically shown by Holland Holder in 2003. It showed that for any advective diffusive flow, the one-way flux is gonna be dominated by the number of particles that cross the tropopause rapidly due to, due to diffusion. So unless you condition that air somehow in spending a certain amount of time, that one-way flux is gonna become infinitely large. And so the question then is, what residence time do we use? There's no natural choice. If there was a physical choice of this residence time, then it would make sense to condition this on one day or two days or three days. But so since there is no natural physical residence time, and since in addition to that, the flux is singular for increasing, for increasingly small residence times, instead of, the posing, instead of posing the question as what is the one-way flux, irrespective of residence time, we ask what is the one-way air mass flux that resides in the stratosphere for time in the interval tau tau plus d tau. So we measure the full distribution of the flux as a function of this parameter, the strength, this residence time. So how do we do that? Well, we use um, <coughs> g represents a Green's function. So, so we use a, a tracer that has been used before in the stratosphere. And this is a tracer that has been used to calculate age spectra uh, from which quantities like mean age have been derived. And all it is, it's just the solution to the passive tracer equation subject to an initial pulse boundary condition and zero boundary conditions of the tropopause thereafter. And so this, this sometimes you might have seen this because let's say you had a, have a tracer at the tropopause that has a given boundary condition and you want to know what the solution is going to be in the interior. Sometimes this Green's function allows us to propagate those boundary conditions into the interior. But we're not going to be using it for that condition instead, for that, for that application instead. We're just going to be looking at the Green's function itself because this gives the complete, basically tells you how the flow is going to spread tracer. It's going to give you the integrated effects of infection diffusion. So G is what we're interested in. This is how we're going to get our distribution. And it gives, in the interior of the stratosphere, it gives a distribution of the time since last contact with the tropopause. And so by looking at the flux form of this equation, we can see that this flow rate here, J, is just going to give us the flux across the tropopause partitioned according to residence time. So we're looking at the flux of G as it moves across the tropopause. So G can be seen as a label of air as it enters and exits the stratosphere, and we're going to be measuring the flux of that at every single time step. So this is data that's shown for an idealized model. I'll explain the, the yeah, specifics about this model a little bit later. So this is basically the, the equation for G. We have zero boundary conditions in the troposphere and at the tropopause. We have a pulse initial condition. This is day one or day two. The pulse that lasts for 30 days, which is an approximation to a delta function. And we let this tracer just move in the stratosphere. So it's moving, moves up through upwelling, and it spreads quasi-horizontally. And then we can see that eventually the time it will approach some kind of slope equilibrium. In other words, the gradients of this tracer will equilibrate. And so it seems like this tracer is not decreasing, but this is actually in practice decreasing to zero everywhere. I've just normalized by the maximum in each figure, just to give you a sense of what these slopes look like. So. At every time step, we let this trace remove, and the flux of G at every time step is going to give us the one-way flux of air partition according to residence time. So we measure, we just stand at the tropopause and we measure this flux at every single time step. So I'm going to be showing what this flux looks like and some of the time scales that I can get from that using an idealized model, which solved the, this is a, um, it's called a, it solves the spectral form of the primitive equations uh, it has simplified physical forcing, hence why it's called an idealized model. This has been used, first proposed by Helen Suarez in 1994, and since, it, it's, since that time it's been modified, people have added a realistic stratosphere to it, some people have added a vortex, other people have played around with the topography to have a realistic <coughs> stratosphere variability, but it's simple and it's dry, 
So it's not realistic in that sense. It's a dry model. And we just happened to use a configuration of the model that my advisor's uh, familiar with and one that he helped develop. Um, and it's run a perpetual winter and it has a lot of stratospheric sublimits. So we have realistic stratospheric variability. And then I'm going to be looking at some results from the comprehensive model. So this is GeoCCM. Uh, I looked at this during my time at NASA, and this demonstrates quote realistic transport. It's a comprehensive model. And so now we have a seasonally varying flow. It's not run in just perpetual winter. So we're going to start seeing some differences between the idealized and the comprehensive results. So this is just, again, the wind structure for the idealized model. We see the strong polar vortex here. It's winter. Um, kind of went over some of those details. So how do we compute this flux? So I'm just showing you the winds, zonal winds, tropopause, show here, it's a thermal tropopause. We spin up the model to some initial time ti, and we define our tropopause. So we have a choice of defining where our pulse is going to overlie. Will it overlie over the entire tropopause? Or can we simplify things a bit, which we end up doing? And we apply our pulse over this region here, making the assumption that air mainly enters through the tropics. So we apply our pulse. And then some of this air is going to move throughout the stratosphere. And every single time step, we simply calculate the column integral of g within the troposphere uh, between time steps, because that has to account for all of the flux that has passed through. So this is actually quite a robust way of calculating it, because we don't have to calculate the velocity at the tropopause. We can simply do a vertical integral of the flux that's passed through between time steps, or of the amount of tracer that's passed through. So we do an ensemble of this. We have five initial times T sub i, and then we are, I'm going to be showing you the results for the ensemble average. So the first, so the first question we're going to ask is, so we're asking, what are the mass fluxes and the time scales associated with transport from the tropics to the tropopause? And the first thing we can ask is, what is the flux itself? So this is a figure for the idealized model. This is a log color scale. And so this is a Hoffmuller diagram where the one-way flux of air entering the stratosphere of the tropics has been plotted as, as a function of where it leaves in latitude and as a function of how long it has resided in the stratosphere. So these black lines right here denote the tropical entry region through which air has entered. And all we're doing is we're standing at some time, collecting the flux, and asking how much of that, how much of that air has resided for one year, three years, 15 years, 27 years. And so initially, if we look very close to the tropical entry region, we see that there's this big red blob. So red is big, blue is small, and this is the quote unquote singularity. This is a discrete model, so it's not fully realized, but this is a very large amount of flux that has returned because it stayed in the stratosphere for a very small amount of time. So that's that diffusive jiggle. And we can see that back in the tropics, we get very little flux back because we have a region of mean upwelling. So we have very little air coming back. And then if we park ourselves in the mid-latitudes, we can see that these are regions where there's a lot of air coming back, and that's coming over a continuous time. <coughs> So most of the air. I have a question. Sure. So, how do you assign the latitude when you're integrating over the entire corner? Doesn't the wouldn't there be lateral spread in the troposphere? In the yeah, but this is just a measure of it crossing the tropopause. And so, uh, so we park ourselves at a, at a given latitude, and we just measure the at a given latitude. We measure because by definition, g is zero in the troposphere. We, we removed its identity in the troposphere. And so there's not going to be any spread in the troposphere. Because it's, oh, okay. it's, its identity has been removed. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, yeah, so the question is, some people have raised the issue, of course there's mixing back into it. But all this is, all this is, is, is assessing is the, is the amount that comes down. So so once it reaches the troposphere, then it becomes zero. It becomes zero, yeah. Well, so isn't there like horizontal transport within the troposphere? Yeah. Is that yes. yeah. That's, that's an important detail. That's not measured by this. This is simply calculating the one-way flux. Because the one-way flux, from our perspective, gives information, it gives more information than that flux. So it's true. You could, you could assess that, especially in the vicinity of the, of the tropopause where you have isotropes slicing back and forth. That definitely is something that you could 
the interest of measuring, but all we're doing is calculating from the stratosphere to the troposphere. So, so what you are showing here is that the, the input from the top. Is the input from the top, yeah. What, if I stand, if I stand at the tropopause and I just, if I literally just collect stuff coming down, that's what I would have, so. So perhaps this is not surprising, it has been shown before that isotropes are, this is a region where the isotropes lie, so the tropopause are these natural conduits for structural exchange, but this gives us the time scales. This gives us how much of that area is recited X number of days. Um, and I think that's something that's perhaps surprising is I'll remind you that we have a stronger circulation in the northern hemisphere. So we have, you plot the residual circulation, we have a very much stronger circulation there. And so naively you might think, well, it's stronger there, so therefore air is gonna take less time to leave. Air is gonna be more rapidly flushed down. But we actually see that we have longer, air stays a longer time in the northern hemisphere. And that's just because the residual circulation is not everything. I mean, we have these additional recirculations and only by using a transport diagnostic that probes everything can we actually get the full amount of time that it spends in the stratosphere. So this is, so this is, yeah. Clark, so does it matter if you're like at the top of the tropopause or at the bottom of the tropopause? I, I always kind of envision it as being maybe three layers, right? So if you're one way flux at the top of the tropopause, would you expect that to be significantly different than at the bottom of the tropopause? Does it matter in this? Um, yeah, I mean, we've just resolved it exactly as one model. Um, I mean, it all depends on how you define your tropopause. I haven't, I mean, I've just looked at the thermal tropopause, so there's a definite minimum. Um, so that's where you're. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what the what the degree of lateral spreading would be. Um, I would assume not. Um, it, these distributions would probably be wider in latitude because of the, the mixing. Um, but I I haven't looked at how sharp that is and how that varies in function of latitude. But that that's a good point. Are you letting the tropopause move, uh, move yeah. from time step to time step? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. And. I should have shown you, what I've been showing you so far is just a time mean, zonal mean, but yeah, on a daily basis, it's long. Like so in other words, even if the, if the tropopause went up, and the Between air, yeah, and the air did, that would still be a cross line, <laughs> right? In other words, if the trop height of the tropopause went up, with respect to the air, that would still be defined as a cross line. But that air would be zero because of the definition of the tropopause, because the, the flux is calculated for a tropopause that is moving all the time. So if the tropopause moved up, that air would get an identity of zero. So it would not be counted as having crossed. So the way that the air okay. is zeroed okay. is following in time okay. the, the tropopause, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise there would be a general inconsistency. Okay. Yeah. So. So this is this full kind of residence time profile, but this is a lot of information to take in. You know, this is latitude and residence time, so you, you can be tempted to want to integrate over this. So. so the problem though with integrating over something like this, especially in the vicinity of the tropopause, is that this thing is technically infinite. So this integral is not well defined. And so what instead we use is from the flux, we use a relation here. So J is our flux. We use our flux to construct a distribution R. So what does that mean? So if we stand at the tropopause, we know that the flux that is being fluxed out over a given time has to somehow translate to a mass. And that has to be the mass in the stratosphere that has this expected residence time. So for the case of steady flow, we know that this flux is gonna be related to a distribution in the stratosphere which basically chops up all of the elements in the stratosphere and bins it according to its residence time. And the nice thing about a mass is that it's normalizable and you can integrate it. So from this mass distribution, R, we just take its zeroth moment and just integrate it. And the interpretation of that is the mass of the stratosphere, the fraction of the stratosphere in transit from the tropics to some latitudes. So if 
So now we're just, we're not interested in the individual residence time partitioning, we just want to get some well-defined integrated quantity. And so we ask, how much of the stratosphere is going to leave here? And how much will leave here? So this is a plot of that function of latitude. And we can see that there's something funny here happening over the singularity. And this is very sensitive. This, this is associated with singularity. And if we cut out that singularity, we would not be getting this contribution. So this is an, artif an effect of the an artifact of the, the singularity. And I'd like to draw your attention instead to the, the mid-latitudes. So over the mid-latitudes, we can see that we can definitely say that three times as much air leaves the northern hemisphere as the southern hemisphere in this particular model. So this is a diagnostic that we've just gotten the flux. We've recognized that from the flux, it's difficult to get a nice, robust measure of the total amount coming back. So we've created this distribution. We've integrated it. And we can say that we can make statements like there's x times more mass leaving the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So in addition to looking at that zeroth moment, we can ask, what's the first temporal moment? So let's get a time scale from this. So what is the mean residence time of air that is in transit from the tropics to some latitude of the tropopause? So this is just the first temporal moment normalized by the mass fraction to get a time scale. So air entering in the tropics, how long does it stay in a mean sense before coming down? So for the idealized model, this is what it looks like. So here we have latitude. So what is the mean residence time of air leaving the stratosphere as a function of where it leaves? And so here we have longer mean residence times in the northern hemisphere. And I, and I would think that this is a bit, again, surprising since we have a faster residual circulation there. But the depth of the root axis circulation is higher. That can effectively prolong the time that it takes to move through the stratosphere. And this gives us a measure of the full tropopause to tropopause time that you get. So, I'm sorry, when, uh, when you talk about northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, if it's an idealized head sweater, is you're really talking about winter hemisphere versus winter. summer hemisphere. Yeah, yeah, okay. totally, just winter. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so we'll see that manifest. Yeah, I should I should be clear with okay. that. Yeah, Northern Hemisphere doesn't mean anything. In sure, case. sure, yeah. sure. Exactly. I should be saying one time. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Bird, uh, wouldn't that statement be modified by topography? Well, held swear as I doubt if it is. Well, well actually, in this case, we do have topography. You do have it. Yeah. yeah, so in that case, it would be, so it's it's perpetual It's perpetual Northern Hemisphere winter. You yeah. know, so I guess you have to put them too. So right. topography is in here, um, simply because that's the model that we have with stratospheric variability. But it could be run otherwise. It. So there is topography here. There is topography here, idealized wave number two. Yeah, idealized topography. So northern hemisphere winter. But wouldn't a residence time of seven or eight years not really be, be meaningful because you you have seasonally changing, then then everything would sort of be average yeah. over. Well, if you have the seasonal cycle, then. Well, the seasonal cycle, yeah. So we're going to be looking at some comprehensive results where we do have a seasonal cycle, and we'll see the effect that that has on it. Um, but the, so this was more as to see, this was the first time that such quantities had been calculated, and we wanted to see basically the, uh, the general behavior between other approximations of these time scales, like the residual circulation, which we know doesn't have all the information, but how well does, how well does this scale with the residual circulation? So this was an idealiza idealization of this, and we'll show later on what effect the seasonal cycle has on it. So this is northern hemisphere winter, southern hemisphere winter. Northern hemisphere winter, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So now let's look at the comprehensive result. So this is GEOS uh, CCM. I haven't included a lot of too much information about it, but it's the GEOS 5 atmospheric general circulation model. Um, there's no explicit trace or diffusion term. Um, and it has reasonable stratospheric resolution. The resolution about the tropopause, which is what, we're, what we care about, um, is I think it has about eight levels spanning um, 150 <coughs> to pascals. Um, and the bottom is just taken from the sparsely seen Bell report to show that it's relatively OK in its um, representation of transport. And the diagnostics that they use is AMA, which is an average mean age. Mean age is a function of height. So they just take mean age at different points. They see how well it corresponds with some measures of vertical stat and mixing. And GEOS, I think, is 
here. So I think it does like, pretty well for our models. So now we have, we can't just apply one pulse because our, our flux is going to be a function of, as you mentioned, seasonal cycle when air enters the stratosphere when it leaves. So to probe that, we have, within the first year of the integration, um, we have six pulse tracers, and they're spaced every two months apart. And why do I use six? Well, that's because, that's based on some um, age spectrum calculations that somebody else using the GSCCM model has used. And he's looked at the minimum number of tracers that one would need to get the uh, seasonal cycle for age spectrum. So I kind of assumed that that would be sufficient for the flux, but that's an assumption. So I have six pulse tracers in year one. So in January, this is a pulse of one month, and then I calculate the flux thereafter. And then in year two, I generate a second ensemble of that. And then in year three, I generate a third ensemble of that. So that by taking an average of three ensembles, I have six one-way flux distributions as a function of when, during the year, that air entered. And um, I've made, made an assumption that interannual variability is not that big. I haven't included the QBO. The QBO is explicitly suppressed. Um, but that's, that's what we've done. Uh, and this is, I should mention, this is a time, this is, these are both time slice integrations. So I'm, I'm running a time slice integration that's 30 years. One is subject to 2010 fixed forcing, so it's a time slice integration. And then I run a future warming, subject to 2090. So let's just look at some examples of what the boundary propaganda looks like. Um, so here what I've done is I'm just looking at the boundary propagator shown here in the color. I've put lines of PV. Uh, the trophic clause is shown here in the black, or the mean of it. And I'm showing this for the case of air entering in January versus air entering in July. So let's just look at how the tracer moves differently. So we can see that within one month, there's been a rapid spread of tracer that entered in July to the northern hemisphere high latitudes, much more rapid than for air entering in January. And this is consistent with um, the seasonal cycle of the subtropical lower stratosphere mixing barrier. It's much weaker during northern hemisphere summer, and so we would expect tracer just to flush out. So this is going to have some effect on what our flux distributions look like. So we can just step through time, and we can see that eventually, for the January pulse, when summer begins to kick in, we see a spread of tracer there. So returning to our key questions, we ask, what is a one-way mass flux pre and residence time now for the comprehensive model? Yeah, this is just a sort of a naive question. So you said you are looking at time scales of years. So are you worried about numerical diffusion uh, stuff? Uh, I, I have no idea about those kind of things, but, but yeah. you have tens of thousands of, of time stamps, so, so wouldn't how, how much role would numerical diffusion play? In yeah, I, ha I haven't. Um, I don't. I don't know how much kind of error that could. Um, I haven't looked at that. Um, trying to. I mean, I assume that you know if it's operating. I mean, by that time, it takes about tracer maybe like a few months or one year to reach, uh, it starts off with a very kind of sharp initial condition. We start off with this initial pulse, and then that slowly gets spread further on. Um, so I know that numerical issues arise, especially at the very beginning, um, when you have these sharp gradients, and that's really much a function of your representation of the diffusion, the scheme that you use. Um, I've done some tests with the numerics for the idealized model. Um, with a comprehensive model, um, I mean, it's mass conservative, and it obeys certain properties that it should. Um, but I haven't looked at the, yeah, I haven't looked at the, the long time possible propagation of errors from that. But it's something I should look at, yeah. <coughs> so this is the, the one way flux of error. Um, apologies for using a different color scale, but this is the one-way flux of air, similar to what we showed before for the idealized model, and now it's shown as a function of when air enters the stratosphere. So here we have air entering the stratosphere in January versus air entering the stratosphere in July. 
So all we're trying to do is just quantify the seasonality of these one-way flux distributions as a function of entry time. So this is latitude, and this is residence time. And I've blown up the first two years just to highlight the behavior at the very beginning. So here, this large red blob over the tropics is that large singularity that we see. We see that in both cases. And then we see that for air entering in July, the small residence time flux, small residence time flux is much larger. And that's consistent with the boundary propagator that we saw. We have basically a direct path into the northern hemisphere, and so that manifests in these large fluxes. Whereas here in the northern hemisphere, we have very small fluxes, and this is the polar vortex that is still very much formed, and that's going to inhibit any air getting there. So this is at least consistent with dynamics with what we know. And so we can see that later on, we have this seasonal imprint. So roughly every single, we can see that, that these fluxes tend to peak every single year. So there's this seasonal marker that's the seasonality parts to it. And we also have this return flux into back into the tropics. And that's something that we didn't see in the idealized model. So apologies, this is shown on a different scale, but we can do a comparison with the idealized model. In a very general sense, they both show the singularity. We have most of the return fluxes back in the latitudes, but here we have a seasonality that we don't see here in an idealized model. And so there's a whole complexity that that imparts to it. But at least there's a general consistency in the shape. And we've also looked analytically at the, the form of the singularity, basically uh, the scaling of that. And surprisingly, that doesn't depend on season. But that's kind of a technical. So we can just integrate the flux that I've shown before. We can integrate it over latitude, and we can plot that now as a function of entry time. So this is for the southern hemisphere mid latitudes. This is the northern hemisphere mid latitudes. And we can ask, what is the one-way flux as a function of when it enters? So we can see that in the southern hemisphere, for air entering in January and March, the flux of small residence time is going to be a lot larger. And then it's the opposite in the northern hemisphere. So the shapes of these fluxes the timing of the peaks depends on when they enter. And that's consistent with the seasonality of the transport barrier that we've seen. And so even though at the very beginning, what we saw here is that the flux is very sensitive at early residence times, as we move on to larger residence times, the memory of the initial condition is lost. And so these fluxes consistently peak at certain times in the year. So in the tropics, we have peaks in the summer, the weak barrier. And then further along, we see peak in the northern hemisphere in July, and then in the southern hemisphere in March. And this is consistent with the seasonality of the polar vortex. So these are just some maps of the flux. We've been looking at all these zone mean quantities so far. So what does the actual flux look like at different stages? So this is very early on in the integration, and this is very late on. So we can see that there are big differences in the flux distributions initially. We have rapid spreading for air entering in July into the northern hemisphere with strong barrier, strong gradients into the winter hemisphere. Same here. Now we can see at the very end that the memory of this initial entry time has been lost, and that the distributions, even though the magnitudes are different, but the, but the actual spatial distributions of this flux are very similar. So, like we did with the with the idealized model, we can ask what is we can form a distribution R which is related to the flux. And this gives us what is the residence time partitioning of the mass in the stratosphere. So if I took the mass and I just chopped it up into its expected residence time, what would that be? So there's some complications here because we don't have a steady flow. And so we use the expression for this, which I didn't put right here, but it's, it's for non-stationary flow. And in that case, in the case of steady flow, it reduces to this, which is a nice expression. It's not so nice for the comprehensive flow right here, but we could form this distribution. And that gives us the residence time partitioning of the air in transit from the tropics to some area of the tropic clouds, given that it entered, given that it's in transit at a certain time. So what is the what is the fraction of the stratosphere in transit from here to here? And so I'm just showing you the annual mean picture of this fraction. Topography is shown in white. So this is annual mean latitude longitude picture of this, of this fraction, and this is the zonal mean component of it. So if you remember for the idealized model, we had this big singularity. It was, here it's been flipped just to, to the axes align. And we saw that in the northern hemisphere, we had a lot more 
we had a much higher fraction. But now we have a seasonally variant flow, so the fractions are much more symmetric between the, the hemispheres. And we can see that at least our flux has some physical, is physically realistic, despite all the assumptions we've made about the tropopause and things like that, because of where this air is leaving. And this is consistent with the pattern of the storm tracks. Other climatologists of the flux have, have shown similar kinds of figures, except this quantifies it exactly. Where is the flux coming back? This is a region where we have tropopause folds. Even though I haven't, I haven't looked at the climatology of tropopause folds, but I have looked at the spatial distribution of the anti-kinetic energy, storm tracks, and there's a good co-location between them. What's, what's the resolution of the horizontal resolution? Uh, two by two. So yeah, so we're not resolving processes that are better than that, but they're finer than that. And so finally, just like we did for the IELIS model, we can also now look at the mean residence time of air in transit. So how long does it take to move throughout the stratosphere? And so this is the mean residence time of air now for the comprehensive model, and I've shown the idealized results right here. So first difference is that we have non-zero mean residence times back into the tropics. And this is, was reflected in the flux distributions. We had air. Now we have a mechanism for air to actually come back into the tropics versus in the perpetual northern hemisphere winter circulation, we always have, we had no means for air to return back. So now we can see that this imparts some kind of time scale to it. So now air is roughly half a year old when it returns back to the troposphere. But we can see that the, roughly the shape is similar. Um, this time is roughly five to six years here in the IDS model, it was like seven to eight years. Um, but this is a model that like Edwin Gerber at Quran has looked at, um, has also looked at transport in this model. The transport's not been looked at that well in this idealized model, but it has been shown that it's, the time scales are too long. So the fact that these are a little bit um, less than what we've seen before is not too worrisome. Um, and now we can see we actually, now for flow that's seasonally varying, uh, we actually have um, shorter mean residence times in the northern hemisphere. Now that's a function of having, I mean, mean residence time is going to be the integrated effect of everything. It's going to be, and so it's, it's not as easy to say that this is the effect of you know, having additional topography or something, but this, these are numbers that now we can actually trust. Here in the idealist model, this was for some kind of idealist representation of the atmosphere. And so, um, so the question is, you know, how do these distributions change in the future? Um, and I think that mean residence time is a, is a, is a nice diagnostic, especially for um, chemists who are looking at um, the ozone depleting potentials of things like uh, very short-lived species. Basically, the depletion that they can do is a function of where they move in the stratosphere and how long they reside there. And so this residence time is a way of capturing that. So just to conclude, we've uh, introduced a set of new diagnostics of one-way SDE. Uh, the one-way flux is difficult to estimate. We've tried to make diagnostics that circumvent the problems with that by measuring it as a full distribution. We have the one-way flux, the partition according to residence time. From that, we created a distribution that we could get the mass fraction of the stratosphere from and transit from the tropics to high latitudes. And then we looked at the mean residence time of that error and transit from the tropics to, to some other latitude, or latitude longitude in the comprehensive model. So for the comprehensive results, we looked at the systematic dependence of that on entry time, on the exit time. We saw that there was a consistency between the numbers we were getting and the behavior of the polar vortex evolution, of the, the polar vortex and of the subtropical mixing barrier. And um, I haven't shown these here for, for reasons of time, but we do have some results of the future time slice integration where we've looked at the changes in mean resonance times in the future. Um, and I actually have a figure of that, but I'll just show since I have a few more minutes. So I've looked at um, changes in the flux distribution. So here what I've done is I've plotted the flux integrated over the northern hemisphere and then over the southern hemisphere and these are these long tails that we have at the end of these distributions. The blue lines show the results for the 2010 time slice integration, and then the red lines show it for the 2090 time slice integration. And we can see that in the future these tails decrease. 
and then if you integrate over distribution with a shorter tail, generally, that will translate to a shorter mean residence time. So. So is this for uh, model simulation that uses the 2090s uh, winds and yeah. you don't change them with time? We don't change them with time, yeah. So these are just time slice integrations. If we had had time varying, then we would have had needed to use several other tracers. Um, the number of tracers you use is a direct function of the complexity of, of it. So this was the simplest way that we could get some kind of climate change experiment for that. So I would just like to conclude with that. And uh, we've written up the idealized results here. This is published. And we're, we've, we're writing up the Goddard comprehensive results. And it's in preparation. It will be submitted soon. So thank you. No, I have a question. Sorry. So, uh, so what are some of the practical uh, implications of these results? For, for instance, uh, so after a volcanic er eruption like El Chichon, mm -hmm. so would we find more, one year later would we find more sulfate in the atmosphere at mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere? I mean, yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good application. So, um, one of the motivations for looking at the how the, the dependence on entry time is that, uh, yeah. for example, we get a plot of residence time. And we can say, how does residence time depend on when that area first entered the stratosphere? So for a case like you know, a volcanic event occurring in July, by what amount is that time reduced? Okay, so, 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 uh, so this uh, should be verifiable, right? Because we have data mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the uh, LC John and, and Pena Tubo. You can see, yeah, and so you can see consistency. So there should be asymmetry between the north and the south. Um, yeah, for aerosols, which, are, yeah. which aren't chemically being depleted. There should be some, yeah, I mean. There's a complication there because the volcanoes occur in different parts of the QBO, which seem to be important, and that's suppressed. Yeah, this was suppressed here in this model. So interannual variability is something that's not included here. So, yeah, so, but, uh, so then there's not really a very robust result because you are showing things for like after one year, a distribution after one year. And, and so, which is really not realistic if you are, if you don't have the QBO. Because sure, sure. This is this is um, you know, uh, this is the second time. This is the first time these have been calculated for comprehensive flow. So sometimes there's some simplifications that one has to do. Um, that's that's true. The QBI, QBO could be represented definitely, um, and it would be nice, you know, in a sense to quantify that. Um, I would expect that the QBO though would have. Um, would probably have a big impact on those the, the distributions back into the tropics, especially that we're seeing. Um, but but certainly, um, this is a simplification that we made. Um, and uh, if we look at that in the future, that that could be something that we include. True. Um, but going back to the the issue of the um, how verifiable this is and things like that. So we've we've been looking at can you extract these time scales from observations? Um, sorry. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, Going back a decade or so, there are some pretty, pretty good observations of residence time uh, from the known rate of change of uh, borofluorocarbons reaching the stratosphere, and then measurements that look at that as a function of time in both hemispheres, and they come up with about seven to eight years of average residence time, mm -hmm. as I recall it. Okay. Yeah. HSCs, right? Pardon? The HFCs, right? When they started. Well, CFCs, them. HFCs, yeah. They, you can do it with any long lived tracer. And, uh, mm -hmm. so but the CFCs are, are. HFCs are not supposed to get into this. Right? But they do. That's, yeah, so. they, that's right. Yeah. And they measured them in the middle. So, yeah. So, CFC, they get nothing. No, I'm just going back to the decade. The models are all wrong. Before the. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting that the uh, these flux <laughs> values. Seem to agree pretty well. Mm -hmm. Remember, CFCs are not limited; their injection is not limited to the tropics. Yeah. yeah. So that's not yeah. applicable. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, yeah. And so these are, you know, a set of time scales pertinent to the tropic, uh, tropical yeah. tropopause yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. Um, most stuff is up. Yeah. If you still yeah. believe that most of the stuff is up there, tropics, then that's where the CFCs are going to get it. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, a couple of basic questions for the pulse. Uh, for the yeah. pulse itself, is there any shape distribution time? Um, yeah, so it's it's just supposed to be a delta function. Um, 
the, the, the pulse should be delta function, so in theory it should be the second long. But for the long times delta, we have the stratosphere. We just approximate it as a 30-day pulse, a one-month-long pulse. That's what we do in practice. So 30-day pulse. Yeah. So at the Java Patrol with us, the concentration is just set to um, a certain fixed value, is just it, so that's normalized. Right. Is it same for the two models? I mean, the pulse to um, the, to the idealized model and the comprehensive model. Um. Yeah. So I mean, you know, the pulse is going to be guided by the basically the, the seasonality too. Like the length of that is going to be a function of like how um, how the how the how, like the, the complexity of it, but I mean, I, I feel like I've been looking at like some of the literature and like pe how people calculate mean age, for example, which is another thing that you can calculate from this. And it doesn't be, seem to be that sensitive to the length of the pulse, to the width of the pulse. People have been have been using a pulse that's around 10 south to 10 north. So people have looked at kind of the sensitivity of that to the specific. Um, what I do know is that usually the way that people calculate age spectrum from this. Is they look at the they pulse it at the bottom of the of the uh, the, the, the boundary layer, and then what they do is then they measure the time scale from the stratosphere, and then they say, well, my pulse is at the bottom, but I'm just going to subtract off some time that I think it takes to go from the tropics to the tropopause. Um, so there are a lot of we try to be very careful and very precise in the way we did this because there are a lot of kind of assumptions that are currently made in the way that age spectra are calculated. So we we pulse at the tropopause. So we didn't have to make assumptions. When I was at AGU, I had a session, I think the session you were speaking of, there was some talks on the shallow branch of the Brewer Dobson yeah. and the deep branch of the Brewer Dobson. Maybe it was Hell and Garnier. Yeah. yeah. The fact that you're seeing the clear storm track signature mm -hmm. would be an indication of the shallow branch, I guess, right? Um, or not. Well, I think the fact that. I mean, I think I, I think of, so. What are the mechanisms for air coming back? I think of tropopause folds, and I think that that is a region of strong chronicity. A lot of these folds would be happening. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the flux distribution, the actual distribution of time. So the storm track signature is something that you get by integrating over all time. Right. And we saw that over all time, a lot of the flux is coming back in the mid latitudes. So the so trans single trans fold, and then when this fold is. Back. So, so regardless of what the true distribution, you would still think you would still get maximum of the storm track. Yeah, I'm trying yes, to get it, I'm trying to get into my head, and I'm in trouble. Yeah, that the times should be more or less dominated by I think the high branch. Yeah, and so I was trying to I'm trying to see if there's a clear signature in the low branch and the high branch. Yeah, well so sometimes I'm I think it would have been nice if um in that. What I should have done too is when I did the idealized results, um, the idealized model, I, I wanted to see something like like if I took a slice here, like if I took a slice here, I wanted to see some kind of bimodal distribution. That exactly what you're talking about, one peak corresponds to yeah. a shallow, shallow. But I think that when you get down to lower stratosphere, there's so much mixing going on that I think that really it kind of smears out. Um, uh, that kind of distribution. So, yeah, it's not it's not like you have one clear peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, do you have a question? Yeah. You use the 2010 SST as a present post, right? Yeah. So, uh, I think 2010 was the La Nina year. Is there any does that impact on your research, and why do you use 2010 as a present post? Um, that's true. That that could be. Uh, subject to that, that could that could make some effect, um, and that's that's an issue. Thanks. Um, and why did I use that? Well, um, I thought that that would be um, kind of a representative kind of current state. You know, um, you know when you get into kind of um, kind of projections, and, and when you get into the comprehensive model, there's so many things that one can choose and not choose and and uh, our decision to su suppress the QBO for example reasonably might have issues um, but um, in a sense it's it's interesting to kind of simplify sometimes to see these residence time distributions. I think the comparison would still be valid if 2090 is also La Nina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it's also easy uh, to check up the more and it'll be easy different here. Oh, yeah. how to suppress the QBO? Um, we didn't allow some um, some wave deposition. Um, yeah, so that could have. But it's not in the model to begin with. No, no, it is in that model. It is. It is in the GS model. It is. Yeah, it was in one of the gravity wave. Um, so, so you, you 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 tinkered with the gravity wave um, parameterization, or you tinkered with the moment of deposition? I think we we tinkered with the gravity wave. Okay, I've got gotcha. you. Not with the moment. Not we're not saying we're not basically okay. we're, we don't have this crazy source above yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's wreaking havoc. So yeah, okay, that. Gotcha. Um, the, the amplitude of your um, pulses. What, was it the same uh, in, in every single time? So the six times you do it across the year, was it the same? Uh, the amplitude is, yeah, the amplitude is the same. And it, does that hold in reality? So would you have a, 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 in all the year the same entry flux? No, you wouldn't have the same entry flux, but these, um, the whole reason why the, the pulse is more, the, the pul oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the pulse is normalized so that it has the interpretation that oh, it does. Okay. So it doesn't really matter. Um, the whole reason why we get a distribution that has the interpretation that it does is because you just normalize for the amount that's injected inside. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks, Clara. Great talk.